thanks for joining us. I'm Austin Economic Club President Jim Cardle. In 1996, Scott Rasmussen became the first pollster to do daily tracking polls during the election between then-President Bill Clinton and Republican challenger Bob Dole. Yet today, 20 years later, there are now 22 pollsters doing the same thing. And at the same time, they're all struggling with declining landline use, increasing cell phone use, not to mention a frustrated voting public, online polls, and the millennial dynamic. Here we are in the 2016 election between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, and just days before the election, Scott Rasmussen joined us for a presentation to the Austin Economic Club on the 2016 election and the state of American poll. We appreciate you joining us for this presentation. And uh, welcome you to the Austin Economic Club. We're thrilled to be able to have Scott Rasmussen with us today to talk about uh, some things that are seemingly in the news and have been for a while. The election, what are we down to now? 12 days, I guess. But uh, thanks for coming. Let me do a little house cleaning before we get started with the program. I want to first introduce a couple of our board members. Um, Wayne Frankie, Glenn West, and Clint Hatton. Y'all stand up and thank you for coming. We've been around about 10 years now, and I guess what do they say in economic cycles, if you can make it through the first three years, you're probably going to be okay. So we're thrilled to be where we are here today. Also want to thank our uh, table sponsors and our hosts. First of all, our hosts, LCRA. We've got some folks right here from LCRA. Appreciate their support. And uh, though he's not affiliated anymore, old John Boehner's been a good friend in the AECT as well. Let's give our lead sponsors a kind of <laughs> And then take a note on the back of the program, Clint Hackney, Virginia Hermosa with Hermosa Law, Heroes Lodge, Coley Cullen, Potts Riley, Sullivan, Ray Sullivan, and Data Foundry as table sponsors. Thank you all for participating as well. Um, I want to take an unofficial poll myself. I uh, am still one who likes to read things in, in my hands, and uh, everybody knows how much Austin is growing now. I think we're the 11th largest city in America. Imagine that, thanks to Glenn and the Chamber of Commerce and some others. But how many of you, um, I think I saw about six months ago that the Austin Statesman's paid circulation is down underneath 100,000 people now in a city of over a million. How many of you still get the paper in your driveway? Well, it's about 25%, very interesting. Okay, if you read the paper today, the Statesman poll gives Trump an edge of seven points. Uh, Scott, for your edification, they've been running a series here on Tuesday, Monday, and Sunday called The Silent Majority, talking about the minority vote. Big, big, huge issue in this election that is gonna to continue to grow. Um, in import as Texas particularly moves into the future. But um, I don't know about you, I, I monitor polls on a daily basis and uh, I think yesterday I saw on a television news report that Florida has had 1.2 million early votes so far, 1.2 million. Of the 1.2 million, 503,000 were for Donald Trump. 470,000 were for Hillary Clinton, and the remainder were for third-party candidates. But yet you wake up and if you go watch the news or listen to the radio on the way home, it's a dead heat or Trump's behind in Florida. You see this in Pennsylvania and Ohio where the Clinton campaign has not been advertising in Ohio for three weeks or more, and that's based on the strong Senate candidate, Rob Portman, running for re-election to the Senate up there. So the polls are all over the place. They're pulling their hair out because you have fewer people answering their landline. You've got cell phone problems. Scott, I'm sure we'll talk about online uh, 
polling, and there's something called the social desirability bias that's a big issue in the polling industry, and that has to do with how we as individuals will say one thing, particularly to somebody on the phone, different than we would online. And it has to do with our wanting to be part of a group, or certainly not viewed as being part of a group that looks that's looked on, down upon. So we don't give truthful answers. All these things are going into the polls these days, and who knows where we'll end up, but I'm sure that's part of what we're going to get some indication and some insight from, from our speaker today. Um, you'll notice in the program, Scott's bio, the Wall Street Journal says Scott Rasmussen is, quote, a key player in the contact sport of politics. The Washington Post adds that he's a driving force in American politics. But I want to mention one story that I learned last night in visiting with him that started out of an argument with his father back in the mid-70s. Uh, Scott and his father were arguing about this new technology that was called cable TV and how the cable technology was moving out across the country. Obviously now we've got the next wave is our cell phones and everything going to the small screen. But as Scott said, uh, we'll see how many of you can figure out where I'm going on this. Uh, they were trying to figure out how to get into this new technology of cable. And he said he threw together about $9,000 out of his back pocket. He soon had about 35000 from friends and family. You folks that work on campaigns or involved in politics know how you go to your friends and family first. And uh, soon something had launched, a TV station had launched, that was really the prime mover for people to get cable in the initial stages of the cable industry. It was the primary and the biggest reason that cable, that people signed up for cable. And we now know it as what's uh, referred to as ESPN, as a co-founder of ESPN. People will know Scott for the polling business and his work on public affairs. But ESPN, there was a very interesting uh, perspective on how that got started. I will say that Scott's starting a, uh, a think tank and a group out of uh, King's College in New York City. It's the smallest college, I mean, the, the only college in the downtown major city, I believe, Scott, is how you describe it, to focus on the new generation of millennials and how technology is going to save America and how we all ought to be positive about America. But mostly uh, to talk about the election and to give us an update on election 2016 and the state of the polling industry in America. Let's welcome Scott Rasmus. Well, thank you very much. One of the things when I began speaking years ago, a, a wiser, older man told me that you are lucky if one person in your audience remembers one thing you said one week later. And so to help the process along, I'm going to tell you the one thing I'd like you to remember right up front. And it's a simple phrase, politics has failed, America will not. Now that happens to be the name of a book I've got coming out next year, so I hope you remember the book. But it's, but it's much more than that. It's, it's a way that I look at the world. It's something that I've come to recognize over the last five or six years. And I'm going to talk about that a little later, but I, I do understand there's some interest in what's happening a week from Tuesday. So I'll address that first. Uh, we have a, an amazing circumstance in this country today. We have two presidential nominees who are viewed unfavorably by most Americans. There's several groups in the country. There are people who really love Donald Trump and people who really love Hillary Clinton. There are Republicans who are supporting Donald Trump because they have to, because he's their guy, their party's guy. There are Bernie Sanders supporters who are falling in line behind Hillary Clinton. There's some reluctant voters on both sides. 
But the people in the middle who decide this hate both candidates. They loathe the choices before them. And by the way, that's part of the reason I can say politics has failed. These people are looking at the choices and saying, is this the best that you can do? And they're the ones who will decide the election. Where we are today, you know, the, the polls show that Donald Trump is losing. And I think that's an accurate reflection of, of the state of the race. Uh, we have a, a, an election where neither of these candidates has what it takes to win, but one of them has to lose. And that's probably going to be Donald Trump. Now, I can say this with you know, a, a fair degree of confidence, but we live in a strange world. I mean, this morning, for the very first time in my life, I woke up to the reality that the Chicago Cubs won a World Series game. <laughs> and if that can happen, there are surprises that can happen in the presidential arena too. But I want to walk you through to get a sense of, of where things are. In the Electoral College, you need 270 votes to move into the White House. For Trump, that means you have to win all 206 votes that were won by Mitt Romney, and then you need to find 64 more. There are three battleground states that were won by Mitt Romney, Arizona, North Carolina, and Georgia. If Trump loses any of them, he will not win this election. He's ahead in Georgia, but North Carolina and Arizona are toss-ups. He could win them, he could win all three of those, but it's not a sure thing. But if Trump does well in the next 12 days and wins those three states, that only gets him the 206 electoral college votes. There are two states that were won by Barack Obama that are absolute must wins for the Republicans this time around if they want to win the election. One of them is Florida and the other is Ohio. The polls right now show Ohio essentially a toss up, Clinton with a very slight lead in Florida, but the numbers there are shifting and the candidates are both there right now, so there's a lot of intensity there. If Donald Trump wins the three Romney battleground states and wins Florida and wins Ohio, he'd be having a very good day. And that would get him to 253 electoral college votes, 17 short. And finding those last 17 at the moment is difficult. Uh, one way to do it is to win Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is the great white whale of Republican presidential campaigns. Every year it looks tempting. They look at all those votes and they think we're going to get there. And then a half a million vote margin comes out of the Philadelphia suburbs and it just swamps the Republican hopes. Uh, Pennsylvania is possible, but right now the polls show Trump trailing by about six. Uh, it's a heavy lift. There's also a path through Nevada, Iowa, and New Hampshire, but that doesn't look great either. Uh, since I'm in Texas, probably a football comparison is best. The place that the race stands right now in the Electoral College is Team Trump is maybe within a single touchdown, a single score of winning the game. But Team Clinton has the ball and they're running out the clock. And they're very skilled at the tactics of running out the clock. So you need, a, you need a break. Somehow they have to get the ball back and do something to move the electorate in the next two weeks to win. Now, I've heard a lot of people, I heard some last night, talk about the enthusiasm and the first time voters and the people who are showing up at the polls that nobody in this room has ever seen before. And there is definitely truth to that. I hear those stories in central Pennsylvania, and I hear it in rural Texas, and I hear it all over the country. Yesterday, Fox News came out with a poll. One of the most favorable polls to, for Donald Trump in the recent cycles. Trump within three points, within the margin of error. But in that poll, it showed Clinton leading among first-time voters by 16 points. The difference is there are some first-time voters who are coming out of the woodwork because they haven't voted before because they were fed up with the system. And there are some who are first-time voters because they're 22 years old, they're 24 years old, 
those first-time voters are going heavily for Hillary Clinton. Uh, so the numbers are a little bit difficult. A uh, couple of things worth pointing out. As Jim mentioned, polling is tougher and tougher. Uh, it's not just cell phones. You hear a lot of pollsters or a lot of people talking about polls saying, oh, you just have to call people on cell phones. I've got two, two sons. They've had cell phones most of their life. And they do not know that you can talk on a cell phone. <laughs> they text, they tweet, they do everything. They don't talk on it. The reason phone polling worked is because we all talked on the phone. That was a normal means of communication. If you got one of my sons on the phone, which would be impossible as a pollster, but if you somehow got them on the phone and expected them to talk to you for five minutes about political stuff, it's just never going to happen. They wouldn't know what to do. The polling industry in the next five or ten years is going to have to figure out how we deal with this new world. A generation ago, we all talked on the phone. Now we all use social media. I can imagine that someday we'll hear about a poll that was done with you know, 12 percent of the sample came from Snapchat and 16 percent from Facebook and this from this group and somewhere else, but nobody knows how to put that together right now. Uh, we have seen some polling mistakes. The size of the mistakes is exaggerated. We saw some issues with Brexit. We saw issues in the 2014 election uh, related to turnout, but I want to give you a sense of scale. The Brexit polls showed a toss-up. They did not show a big lead for the side that lost. They were only off by a couple of points. In 2014, the polls showed the Democrats doing better in the Senate than they turned out to do in real life. But the polls were only off by a couple of points. What this means is you're going into this election, if Donald Trump has a good two weeks and the polls on the last day show it's a two-point race, then a victory is within the realm of possibility, and that applies in the state of Florida or nationally or any level you want. And by the way, it could also go the other direction a couple of points. Uh, if the polls show that Hillary Clinton has a six-point lead on election day, you might end up in a situation that's closer than we expect, but there is no way, well, I shouldn't say no way, again, the Cubs won the World Series. It's highly <laughs> unlikely that, uh, that a six-point lead in the polls would lead to a Trump upset on election day. One of the big issues has been enthusiasm from the beginning. Democrats have not been enthusiastic for Hillary Clinton. Their base is not as excited about her as they were about Barack Obama. And for much of this election, I was saying that the Trump campaign's biggest hope is not just that white voters turn out in higher levels than expected, but also that the Obama coalition, younger voters and minority voters, turn out at lower levels. The enthusiasm gap disappeared with, the Holly, with those tapes from Access Hollywood. The biggest impact that we saw in the polls after those tapes came out was a huge jump in enthusiasm among Hillary Clinton supporters. And it wasn't so much enthusiasm for her as just a revulsion, a rejection of Donald Trump. And so that enthusiasm gap, it's, it's come back a little bit in the latest poll, but the Democratic base is now much more energized than they were a month ago. And it is specifically because of those tapes that came out. So I don't think the turnout advantage is likely to be as strong as you would have expected for Trump a little while ago. Now, what will this do in terms of the U.S. Senate? You all know the Republicans have a, a difficult uh, job there, defending an awful lot of seats. Democrats only need to pick up four to win control of the Senate. They're almost certain to get Illinois and Wisconsin. Uh, there are several other Senate seats in play. I think the answer is going to depend on suburban Republican women. Uh, these are at best reluctant supporters for Donald Trump. Some of them may go in and not vote for Donald Trump, but vote for a Republican in the Senate. Um, where you'll see this play out a lot is places like New Hampshire with Kelly Ayotte. Uh, it is a dynamic that is very difficult for the GOP right now. 
if there is any decline in turnout among these reluctant Republicans, the Senate will probably go fairly significantly in a Democrat's direction. On the other hand, if by the time November 8th arrives, a number of people say, you know, I really can't stand the idea of Hillary Clinton having unchecked power, then some of these people may show up and vote for a Republican Senate and provide a check on her. Um, I, I think I'd probably say the Republicans have about a one in three shot of hanging on to some level of control of the U.S. Senate. Most likely it will go the other way. Uh, and then there will be a big backlash in two years because it is the Democrats who will be on the fence in 2018. As we, as we look at this process, as you look at this map, though, sometimes people are saying, How, you know, what, what happened this year that made it so ugly? And that's the wrong way to look at this. This problem has been building for a long time. Not all of you, but some of you remember 1992. Bill Clinton moved into the White House uh, after that election. He won with just over 40% of the vote. We have the Ross Perot phenomenon. And Bill Clinton moved into the White House with the Democrats in control of Congress. And he promptly lost control in the first midterm election. In 2000, George W. Bush moved into the White House. And the Republicans were in control of Congress. And he lost control during his administration. That had never before happened in American history in back-to-back -back presidential administrations. And then Barack Obama made it a three firm. He came into, into power with his team in control of Congress and lost control. This is a fundamental rejection of both political parties. People don't like the message they're hearing. They don't believe that there are solutions that are being offered. And this disconnect is creating an awful lot of frustration. Let me give you an example of just how much this, this generational change, this, this split voting has, has uh, I guess, penetrated the conventional wisdom. I was sitting on the makeup chair at, at uh, Fox a couple of days ago, and the young woman who was doing the makeup asked me if there has ever been a time in American history when the president and Congress were controlled by the same party. <laughs> and you laugh. But for the last 24 years, we haven't seen it very much. When I tried to explain that that used to be the way it always worked, she was just stunned. We are in new territory. And the reason, I think, has to do with what I will call the shortest version of, a, of U.S. history that you will ever uh, get to hear. From before the founding of this country all the way up to the 1970s, everything in America became bigger, and more centralized and more homogenized. Corporations got bigger, television networks got bigger, and the government got bigger and more centralized. Not because of some ideological war, but because culture was doing the same thing. It seemed logical. If you have a more centralized economic power, you got to have a more centralized government. And that was something that went on when we talked about, we were talking last night about ESPN. In the late 70s, 94% of Americans watched one of three channels in prime time television. That was the world we lived in before ESPN and CNN and all those other things. And by the way, Jim, it wasn't really the new technology of cable. That had been around. It was the new technology of satellites. Uh, what the satellites did was it let you send a signal around the country less expensively than it used to be to send a signal around a small state. Uh, so all of a sudden, in the 70s, you had the microprocessor invented. You had a couple of guys who dropped out of college to start new school, uh, new companies, uh, Apple and Microsoft. And they began to decentralize society. Uh, and in fact, if you go back and really look at the past several decades, those two guys, Gates and Jobs, have done more to shape our future than all seven presidents who have served since then. In the last four decades, we have all gotten used to the idea of having more and more power in our own hands. And we expect that we can go online and look for anything and shape it our way. We can pick the color and the size and the shipping directions and whatever else we want about any product. And if it's a book, we can decide whether to buy a real print edition or a Kindle edition or something else. We're used to that kind of choice. The only exception to that has been the federal government. While society has been decentralizing, 
power has been more and more centralized in Washington. And that disconnect, that, that fundamentally different way of organizing, is the reason we have such political tension today. Um, one of the ways I describe it is a one-size-fits-all central government cannot survive in the iPad era. We have two candidates this year for president who are from the old era. They're still thinking about centralizing everything, and the generations they're trying to reach can't even imagine that. This disconnect reminds us that change always comes from outside the political process. Positive change always comes when we use our freedom to work together in community. Sometimes we work together as individuals, sometimes as entrepreneurs, sometimes we're doing volunteer work. You know it right here in Texas because of the fracking industry. We have a president today who eight years ago campaigned and said drill baby drill is not the answer to our problems. We can never find enough energy to meet our needs. We need to conserve energy. And on his watch, and despite his opposition, fracking made the United States one of the leading oil producers in the world. The society was leading, and the politicians were lagging behind. There's important work for political people to do, but it is not setting the agenda and deciding the future. Let me ask you a question. When, what year, did women first get the right to vote in the United States? 1920, any other? 1918. I didn't hear anybody say 1869. Uh, Wyoming gave women the right to vote in 1869. Now, Wyoming is known for many things, but it's not generally considered a radically progressive state. So why did they give women the right to vote? All right, now this is going to shock a few of you, and I apologize for that. But guys will do anything to get women to hang out with them. <laughs> in Wyoming, in the 1860s, there were six guys for every girl. They needed a marketing campaign. And they thought, you know, give them political rights. What's the harm? For the next 50 years, Congress voted against suffrage every year. More and more states gave women the right to vote. And in fact, a woman, a Republican woman named Jeanette Rankin, was elected to Congress before Congress even passed the suffrage amendment. And wouldn't it have been cool to be in the chamber that day when she walked in with her 434 new colleagues and the, and the shock that they felt? Yeah. But it wasn't her presence that made Congress pass <coughs> suffrage. It was the fact that so many states had given women the right to vote that members of Congress were being elected with the votes of women. It was a done deal. All that Congress did was confirm the reality that already existed. And then they took credit for it, which is why you all think 1920 is the year that, that suffrage passed. This is the way that change takes place. It's, it's because of a marketing campaign. It's because of outside <coughs> needs. It's because of people working together outside the normal order. Do we have any Harvard graduates here? Okay, I don't know, we're in Texas, so I didn't expect a lot, but the uh, Harvard reflects one of our deepest and most ignored cultural traditions in America. It's a tradition of pragmatic community problem solving. And it was founded in violation of the law. It's an illegal university. Uh, what happened was in the 1630s, a bunch of people fled England because of religious persecution, and they founded this new colony in Massachusetts, and they had a big vision for creating a city on a hill. And if you want to create a city on a hill, you need a leading university to do it. And they had some Oxford men in that colonial crew, so they decided to create a school a lot like Oxford. But there was one little problem. In the 1630s, the law said you cannot form any organization, you could not form the Austin Economic Club without a charter from the king. And the problem with that was the king would have given them a charter, but he would have said you have to teach the Anglican religion. You have to teach that which you fled to, uh, to avoid. And so the colonists, they could have hired some uh, government relations people to try and negotiate through Parliament. They could have 
try to maybe beg for one day a month to get to teach an alternative theology class. But they decided to do something else. They just started a school. They didn't ask permission. And they began teaching students and giving them degrees. King was a little upset, but he got distracted by a civil war in England. Um, it took him around, the, well, it took a later king, because that king lost his head. But a later king had to uh, revoke the charter for the entire Massachusetts colony because of their uh, illegal behavior. And you know what? Harvard just kept on teaching students and giving them degrees. And by the time of the American Revolution, we had seven illegal colleges in the country, and they provided leaders for the revolution. And on top of that, because this was a radical new idea that you didn't have to ask permission, you just went ahead and did something, we had thousands of other voluntary organizations that were providing education, addressing poverty, beginning to fight for abolition, doing a whole range of things that was technically illegal. And to give you a sense of the power of it, and also, by the way, the way politics works sometimes, Thomas Jefferson, after the Revolution, after we had a Constitution, wrote about how powerful these private associations were, the fact they didn't have to ask permission. And he said, we could not have defeated the British without it. But now that our government is in charge, I'm not sure that we should allow that anymore. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence, had that same view. Uh, what really happened, though, the Harvard story lives on to this day. Uh, a modern version of it is called Uber. It's a story that you guys are especially familiar with here in Austin. Uh, it was an idea of you go out and you provide a service. Uh, in New York City, you know, the mayor de Blasio tried to fight it, and he was overrun because there were so many people using Uber, they couldn't figure out a way to do without it. Um, I did take a taxi yesterday. It's the first time I've done that in a long time, because I do use Uber everywhere else. But in this, in this environment, these technological changes are leading the country in a way that is beyond the control of any political uh, force. And, when you begin to think of it this way, our job, if we want to change the direction of the country, we don't have to, citizens don't have to go to Washington and tear down the, the status quo, the leaders of the status quo. We don't need to man the barricades. Change is coming. Jim, you asked about print newspapers. Mm -hmm. About a quarter of your audience read it. Uh, read, a, read a daily paper. But I'll bet every one of them also goes online for information. And a generation ago, everybody in the room would have raised their hand. And they're going to be gone. There used to be a time when local television stations dominated. That era is gone. The technology revolution changed journalism. And in the coming decade or so, it's going to change government. It's going to change health care. And it's going to change education in exactly the same way. And I don't want to pretend that this is easy. Uh, change is good. The things that we're moving to are good. The transitions are really hard. Uh, so while we know that these changes are going to be taking place because of the technology, our job is to make sure that they take place in a way we want to govern them <coughs> so they're consistent with our ideals. Freedom and self-governance, equality, opportunity. We want to make sure that the technologies are guided in that direction. And, and this leads to a, an awkward problem. Uh, and it's something that I dealt with about, I started dealing with about eight or 10 years ago. If this technology is leading to change, and politicians are lagging behind, what is it that we are supposed to do? Um, what is our role as individuals or as a group like this? Uh, eight years ago, I wrote a book called In Search of Self-Governance. And uh, I recently reread it because a, a second edition was published. And I found that at that time, I was really, it was me who was searching. I was very frustrated. I knew the political process wasn't working. I knew there had to be an answer. I couldn't figure out what it was. Um, I had a little bit of a sense, uh, I felt like Dorothy in the movie The Wizard of Oz. You know, she believed in the wizard, and she went and fought a wicked witch, and she went through the dark forest, and she did all those things. And then Toto pulls back the curtain and she found out that he was a fraud. Well, I grew up, I love 
this country. I love our founding ideals. I love the idea that we, the people, were supposed to be in charge. But the more I got involved in the process, the more I realized there wasn't something that one of us could do to bring about political change. I would be in an audience like this and somebody would say, isn't it true that all we have to do is make sure we elect more Ted Cruz? Sort of I mean, fill in the blank. And I couldn't honestly say that your efforts would be effectively used in that way. So as I was searching for this uh, and really frustrated and unable to answer the question of what can somebody do, um, and actually, I guess I, I'm really happy I wrote that book then because about two months after I finished it, we had a devastating event in my family. Um, my, about 5.15 in the morning on March 13, 2010, we were awakened by a police officer and told that the hotel next door was engulfed in flame and we had to be prepared to evacuate. Our house had been built in the 1870s. It was very close to the hotel. We lived in Camp Newton Town. 45 minutes after he knocked on the door, the house was gone. And when I say gone, the appliances melted. There was nothing left. But the good news was the insurance adjuster said, well, it's clearly a total loss. And that was the only, I guess, and nobody was hurt. The fire took out six homes, a B&B, and a hotel. It took 200 volunteer firefighters to contain the damage. It was an absolutely horrible day. But over the 20 months it took us to rebuild, we put a house back in the same location. We got incredible support from our community, from our local government, from people in our church, from neighbors, from people that I didn't even know. In fact, it got to be so much at one point that we had to say, no, stop. We have good insurance. We're okay. Uh, give your money. Give your support to the people in Haiti but people wanted to give because that was part of helping to revive the community. Community problem solving is something that incorporates all aspects of society. Government absolutely has a role to play, but it's not the only role. It's not the only institution. You need an all hands on board approach. Every institution, every relationship plays a role in governing society. If you are married, your spouse plays a role in governing your life. And by the way, you better play a role in governing your spouse's life too. It's part of your responsibility. And when we start thinking about it this way, you gain a different perspective. The political process is one way that we can work together to bring about change. But it's just one way among many. And so the answer to what we should be doing is whatever we can do. We all have different gifts, we have different talents, we have different passions, we have different areas of influence. Some people are entrepreneurs and can bring about change that way. Some people can lead a business into a new way to serve the community. Some people do their best serving in a volunteer role. Uh, whatever it is, we have a nation filled with 65 million volunteers and 22 million entrepreneurs who are pragmatically solving problems every day. So when I look at the world of politics, I see something that is broken because we put it in the wrong position. We've asked political people to do things they're not supposed to do. They're not supposed to lead the nation. We have neglected the other side of the equation, what we're supposed to be doing outside of politics. And and I guess the way that I would describe that, uh, last year, well, it's been a full year now, um, I had shoulder surgery, one of the joys of the aging process. And uh, this shoulder was cut up, and I had to put, uh, I had to go through therapy and have a sling. And because I couldn't use this shoulder, I was using this one too much. And pretty soon this shoulder began to hurt. And I would wake up in the morning and I'd have a heating pad on here and an ice pack on there. It was really a miserable way to start the day. So I whined about it because guys are lousy patients. And I called my doctor and said, you know, what am I going to do about this right shoulder? He said, the only way you can fix your right shoulder is to do your therapy and get your left shoulder working the way it's supposed to. Once you do that, you'll take the burden off and your right shoulder will be fine. If we want to fix the political process, if we want to have elections that we can feel better about where the choices are more uplifting, we need to first do the other part. We need to get involved in community problem solving at every level. If that means you need to start your own school, get together with people to do that because you're tired of fighting the 
universe, uh, the, the, the traditional public school system? Well, great, start a school. Uh, we have a problem right now in the country with higher education. There are 4,076 universities, 4,074 of them accept federal student loans. What's the problem with that? Once you accept those loans, you put the federal government in charge of all of your guidelines. You have no alternatives. Now, you can fight that, and you can fight the administration's description of whatever the rules should be, but we shouldn't be in a place where higher education is determined by who wins the presidential election. So maybe what you need to do is start a new school, or maybe what you need to do is find somebody who can help get one school out of the federal loan system and begin to operate a little more independently. Hillsdale College, by the way, which is one of the two that does not accept federal funding, they provide loans to their own students. And in a time when the federal student loan program has a 40% default rate, Hillsdale's just rose to 1.3%. If you begin to shift the responsibility and find different ways of solving problems, that's the way you can move the nation forward. I'm going to close by, by telling a quick story of a, of a guy who you've never heard of, and I'll take a few questions if you'd like. Uh, but on April 19, 1775, a guy named Levi Preston and 76 of his buds stood to face the British in what became known as the Battle of Lexington and Concord. 19 of those 77 were shot in the very first volley of the American Revolution. Many decades later, when Levi Preston was in his uh, late 80s, a young historian found out this guy was still alive. And he was really excited. I want to go talk to Levi Preston and find out what it was really like at the time of the Revolution. So he goes in and he, he sits down and, and asks Levi Preston about, you know, why did you go fight? Was it the, you know, the inspirational writings of Locke and others? Nope, never had no books except the Bible in our house. Was it was it the Tea Party or the Stamp Act? And, uh, never knew, never needed stamps. The boys threw all the tea in harbor. Nothing to do with it. And he kept going with all the reasons that historians were ascribing to the American Revolution. And clearly, you can sense in the, in the discussion the historian was getting frustrated. He finally said, "Then why did you show up and fight?" And he said, "Because we'd always been free." and the British meant to take that away from us. We weren't going to let them. We need to get this idea that we all have a role to play in solving community's problems. It's not enough to rely on politics and government to solve them for us. We need to embed that as deeply in the American culture as the idea of freedom was long ago. And it's really the same message. It is freedom that we cherish, and we want to use that freedom to work together in community. That's why I believe that politics has failed and America will not. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Excellent, Scott. Thanks a bunch for those comments. Okay. We always prided ourselves on uh, starting at 8 and ending promptly at 9 and having good program in between. You mentioned uh, elected officials. I forgot to recognize Dan Flynn, state rep, Jason Isaac, state rep, and Gerald Doherty, our Travis County Commissioner. I don't think there's any other elected officials that I've missed here, but um, questions. I'm going to start with one. Scott, talk about, you mentioned the health care and the education and government being some of the industries that will have uh, or be impacted by technology. Talk about the polling industry and what the impacts a little bit more and the struggles will be for technology there. And then who's got a question after that? You know, the, the biggest problem with the polling industry historically has not been with the polls, it's been with the interpretation of the polls. Uh, people have come to ascribe way too much precision. If a poll says that a candidate should win by three points and the candidate wins by four points, you say, what's wrong? Uh, the interpretation, a healthier view, is to treat all the polls a little bit like the way on the East Coast we treat the hurricane modeling. I think there's 13 different hurricane models. 
And when they start to show a storm is moving up the coast, you don't know exactly where it's going to hit. But you get at least a ballpark idea. And what that ballpark idea tells you is, if it looks like it's going to hit the Jersey Shore, we better get water in and be ready for it. And we'll be thankful if they're wrong, but you do that. But we don't care if it hits our town or six miles down, we still have the same effect. What polls can do on the interpretation side, right now, the reason I went through the Electoral College the way I did, is that polls tell us where to look. So when you're watching on election night, if you see early in the evening that Donald Trump has won Florida, well, then you have a reaction that this could be close because he's, that's what the polls showed us was a critical state, it was a toss-up. And by the way, if he wins Florida by six points, then you say, whoa, something's really going on here. On the other hand, if he loses Florida, the polls have given you enough information that you know the race is over. So the interpretation is one part. I, my real question about polling isn't so much polls themselves as to whether they'll still be around and useful in the era of big data. We can collect so much more information today that it is impossible to, uh, to, to, to really separate out the big data collection from the polling issues. Uh, and I think that's going to be the question for the industry is finding a niche, finding a place for itself. We've got another question from Jim Darwin. Scott, thanks for uh, coming down to Austin, keeping us weird down here, as they say. I, one thought came to mind when you mentioned about the two candidates are pretty much in the old style, old ways of thinking, and, and, and everybody's moving forward. Is that also an indication that we've seen since about the late 70s where both parties started going in different directions? He went in different directions, the left way to the left, the right way to the right. And what do you see as that transcends forward? Uh, it is certainly a part of that, that pattern. And actually, I think a lot of that has to do with the change in the presidential nominating process. In 1960, John Kennedy only took part in, I think, in six or eight primaries. Uh, most of the states had caucuses, or they had their state party assign where the delegates would go. And they made a lot of deals. Uh, that process encouraged both parties to reach to the middle to try and attract more votes. Uh, then through a series of, of circumstances, you know, there was a horrible Democratic convention in 1968. A guy named George McGovern was appointed to select, to come up with a new nominating process, began the primary system, and you know, through no coincidence, the guy designed a system he could win, so he became the Democratic nominee in 1972. The Republicans followed along in 1976, and now we have a system where primaries determine the nomination. And it's no coincidence that since that time, we have had only one presidential landslide, which was Ronald Reagan in 1984. Before that, we had landslides at least every other election, and that's really important to the health of our political system. We have a landslide, the losing side knows they lost, you don't fight about legitimacy. You alter your message. You know, after 1984 and Reagan winning 49 states, no Democrat came out the next year and said, we need to raise taxes. They, they knew that message wasn't right. Uh, so I think you're right. This is a part of the problem uh, that the party system has gotten a little bit skewed because of the primaries. But the other part of it is that whole technology and other things. I mean, we now have more power in the palm of our hands than the president had in the 70s. The 200 million smartphones in the country are the greatest force for change in the history of the world. And no institution has figured out how to deal with that yet. Next question from Brent Elliott. Oh, yeah. uh, first of all, thank you for the ESPN. I think Chris Berman has changed my life. <laughs> um, I guess I'm curious what polling is supposed to mean for anybody. And with all the cynicism recently about you know, who's ahead or who's not. Do you see that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy? Does it, if people see that and they see it as hopeless, do they stay home? Do they see it as motivation and they show up? And, you know, do you see an effect of polling on people's actions on election day? Because it doesn't change my foundational values. I just kind of see where it's going. But I'm curious if you see people generally stay home or show up with more enthusiasm because of polls. There's, uh there's a huge uh, stack of evidence that says in primaries, 
people vote because of what the polls are saying. The shift is, and you see it, you saw it this year, when there are 17 candidates, um, you begin to vote based on who the leading candidates are. Uh, by the end of the primary season, it became, are you for or against Trump? Uh, and that was because the polls and the early results showed that. There is far less evidence that it has an impact on the general election poll, uh, on the general election turnout. Uh, that has much more to do with a huge chunk of people always vote, and there are sometimes very good get out the vote efforts on the ground by different campaigns. I think this year the place we could see a, an impact from the polling would be if we get to election day, and, I, and I'll just pick an easy scenario. If things have gone bad, more tapes have come out, and Donald Trump is trailing by 10 points nationally, the state of Utah might vote for Evan McMullen. Uh, they don't like Trump, it will be a third party vote. On the other hand, if the poll shows on election day that the race is tied, I have no doubt that Utah will cast its electoral college votes for the Republican nominee, as they usually do. But in general, um, the, there's not a whole lot of evidence show that it impacts people. Uh, something else you should be aware of, until the mid-90s, we didn't have polling anywhere near the volume that we had today. Uh, and that daily nature of polling at first gave it great power. In, in 2004, my tracking poll was the only national tracking poll, the only daily poll out there. Four years ago, there were 22 of them. Uh, so no one poll has the kind of influence it used to. One final question from Bob Green. Quick question. Uh, thank you once again for being here and, and speaking to us today. Uh, you mentioned early on the impact on the polling based on the video that came out. Uh, then you talked about uh, how that affected it immediately. What would you think might be the impact, or do you think will be the impact, of the pulling back of the curtain by WikiLeaks and uh, what's showing the inner sausage making? in the DNC and so on. Well, there's, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room and in the state of Texas who think that that WikiLeaks disclosure should have at least as big an impact as the videos. Uh, some would argue more of an impact. There's two reasons uh, why it won't. Uh, part of it has to do with the videos themselves. Part of it has to do with the fact that the Republican nominee cannot shine the spotlight anywhere but on himself. We, you know, the Republicans do not have a candidate who can, on a sustained basis, talk about Hillary Clinton and in in, in make that case. But the other fact, and this one is a little bit discouraging, I, you know, I, I wish I didn't have to say this, but what's, what's disclosed by the WikiLeaks information is what people think is normal in politics. They do not, you know, maybe Clinton raised a little more money than somebody else. They, they may think the Republicans are jealous that they couldn't build as big a foundation as she did. But that seems the norm. In, uh, when Bill Clinton was going through his Monica Lewinsky problems, we began a series of questions that we asked every time a candidate had a scandal. And the question was something like, uh, is you know, Bill Clinton, more ethical, <coughs> less ethical, or about as ethical as most politicians. And in the worst days of those scandals, 60, 65, 67 percent said he was at least as ethical as most politicians. The stunning demographic was that no matter what you believed about Bill Clinton, if you believed that somehow he was involved in the Vince Foster suicide, you still believe he was as ethical as most politicians. We asked that scandal after scandal. And only one time in all the years did any politician come in with less than 50% believing his ethics were the norm. I mean, Ted Stevens, the day after he was indicted, 70% in Alaska said, yeah, he's, he's a politician. Uh, but Rod, Rod Blagojevich was the one exception. A lot of mine, look, I don't think those, those allegations may play a big role in the administration next year, but they're not going to shake, shake up the election. Thank you very much. Scott, we appreciate your comments.
what you've uh, done over the years for politics and focus on better government in America. We always give our guests a little token of appreciation to Scott Rasmussen 2016 Distinguished Lecture Series with great appreciation and thanks for your tireless efforts on behalf of our nation. Let's give Scott a round of applause. Well, according to the most powerful device in the world, in my pocket, it says it's a couple minutes after 9 o'clock, so we are adjourned. Thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.